I am so curious as somebody who has seen so much in Silicon Valley, how much do you think has changed when it comes to the representation and treatment of women in technology and what hasn't changed? Well, you know, I actually started in tech after I left Clorox in 1983, so a long time ago. And um, at that time, it really felt like a meritocracy. There was certainly other things going on that were a little um, head scratching, but it really felt like, because it was such a nascent industry, we were all pulling together, and, it, and you actually progressed based on your work. Certainly, it has changed quite a bit, and some things haven't changed. I would say, if you look at the latest funding report, women are still sort of stuck at 3% of total venture capital goes to females. It's been stuck there for over a decade, and it really never has gotten any higher. That's the bad news. The good news is, um, due to um, Emily Fowler and other activities, there is a light being shined on the bro culture, and I think while I don't expect that much to change, at least bringing that culture forward, which has gotten progressively worse after the dot-com, I think is a very positive thing for men and women. One of the things I examine in my book, Brotopia, about the evolution of women in tech is the idea of meritocracy. And people often refer to Silicon Valley as a meritocracy and, and believe it's a meritocracy, but often it can sort of ignore the privilege at play for the winners and the, the larger systemic factors working against everyone else. Do you think Silicon Valley is a meritocracy? I think it has a chance to be. I think certain companies are. It's pretty hard to make a generalization. Um, if you look at the funding, I would say clearly not because women aren't getting even a little bit. We're not making any headway. Um, but I think there are certainly companies that have best practices that reward people on what they do, not what gender they are or the color of their skin. And I think when you're in a fast-growing industry like tech where innovation and creative thinking counts, then in fact people do have an ability to rise up faster than in something that is a slower growth company that may be basing um, promotions and advancement opportunities on other things. So when you're looking for talent as somebody who you know probably has greater insight into the challenges that women face, how are you hiring? What are you doing to hire and promote women and defy the dismal average of most tech companies? All right, so now we have about 1,200 employees, so we're getting pretty big. 70% of my workforce is female, so I think we're sort of on that. Um, where we still fall down is on my engineering team has very few women, although it's, um, we're adding more. And part of that is because we don't get a lot of women applicants. So I would say we don't look at gender when we're hiring, but you know, by default, we are hiring more women. We are mostly in, you know, fashion and luxury resale, so I think it does attract a certain type. But to be honest, we try to hire the best candidate. And um, if you look, if you walk through our office, it's, um, we have women, we have men, mm -hmm. we have, you know, we have a great diverse employee population. So we've been really focused on sexism lately, especially with the Me Too movement. I think racism in Silicon Valley deserves an entire book on its own. Something else that you've uh, touched on is, is ageism. And in Silicon Valley, you know, we, we sort of imagine all of these young college kids on these uh, fancy campuses, which are actually company headquarters. How big a problem do you think ageism is in technology? Oh, it's, you know, it's huge. And again, you know what? Look, if you're a woman and, and you're a woman over 50, actually probably a woman over 40, you're going to have a hard time getting capital unless you're in biotech but I am not an advocate of looking at all the obstacles I think it's great when when reporters especially your book I kept I ordered your book today by the way I don't want to plug it but <laughs> I did you. order it Thank you. Um, because it's certainly the excerpts have been interesting but look here's here's the story there it's harder for a woman over 40 it's certainly harder if I was a black woman over 40 to start a business, raise money, and especially when you're getting started and you're pitching to 28-year-old guys. And if it's a female-focused business where the consumer's a female, they really can't relate. Um, and then they look at you and you're like, oh my God, I know like you're older than my mom. So look, it's hard, but that doesn't mean it can't be done. 
and certainly it gets easier at once you get past the seed or the concept stage and you actually have real business results, then the playing field equals out a little bit. But I would say it's clearly harder for women. It's harder for older women. It's harder for older men. I mean, you don't really see a lot of men over 50 pitching businesses in the VC's office. You have transformed the luxury consignment business at The Real Real. You know what it takes to keep a business uh, functioning over years. What is going to make The Real Real stand out with so many new e-commerce and fashion companies trying to revolutionize the way we buy things? You know what, we are actually changing the way people think about consignment. And we really are a change factor. We've transformed the ease of consignment. We removed a lot of the friction. We'll come to your house, you can send it in, you can meet with a gemologist, you can FaceTime with someone. So we've taken away a lot of the barriers for actually even doing consignment. And then because we take possession and we authenticate and we make sure the quality is good, we've also taken away a lot of the barriers for buying consignment. So our buyers, 50% of them had never bought consignment before. And our consigners, 50% had never consigned before. So we're really expanding the market. And you know, in many ways, we actually aren't that different than other people that have changed the paradigm. Like, you know, Airbnb changed the paradigm. They've got more hotel rooms than all hotel rooms together. They expanded the market, and we're expanding the market. I just want one last thing. We did a relationship with Stella McCartney that's just getting started for her goods. And she, and this is going to be a normal thing. You buy luxury goods, and then because they're high quality, you then consign it. And it's really good for the planet. So I think even having the first big luxury designer um, as a partner is going to actually help pave that way. We're pretty excited.